as we focus on our challenges in the healthcare arena, how do we continue to support more comprehensive access to clinical information to make informed decisions to produce the highest quality outcomes to individuals. That was the Secretary of Florida's Agency for Healthcare Administration, Mary Mayhew, speaking at the 2019 Florida Health Information Exchange Summit. The agency, or ACA as it is sometimes called, has a mission of better healthcare for all Floridians. In addition to the administration of the state's Medicaid program, ACA supports several health information technology initiatives that offer patients and providers ways to manage and improve their own health care and the health care of their patients. In honor of National Health IT Week, this is our first episode in which we will take a look at what ACA is doing to provide health IT solutions to the state of Florida. Welcome to Health IT Matters, a podcast in which we explore the ways health information technology is transforming healthcare locally in Florida and on a national level. I'm your host, Chris Wilkie. Health IT is something that we have been hearing more and more about. Whether it is the exchange of your medical record between healthcare providers or getting a medication prescribed electronically, I sat down with a few in-house experts at the Agency for Healthcare Administration to find out a little more about what health IT initiatives they offer. Here's Pam King, the Health IT Outreach Coordinator for ACA. Hi Pam. So the interest in health IT seems to be growing and growing. There was some legislation passed earlier this year in Florida that directly relates to some of your initiatives. I've heard that one of those areas was e-prescribing. You're absolutely right, Chris. There was legislation that passed this year that requires prescribing practitioners to e-prescribe medications by July 2021 or their licensure renewal period, whichever one of those comes first, if they use electronic health record systems, which of course most um, practitioners today use EHR systems. Uh, There are a couple of exceptions to the law, but the language does support an increased use in in e-prescribing, including controlled substances. Although the legislation is new, e-prescribing has been going on for some time now, right, Pam? Absolutely. The agency has supported and been sharing information about e-prescribing since way back in 2007. Of course, when we started this initiative, the focus was on ensuring prescriptions were legible for pharmacists in order to reduce medication errors. Today, the focus has shifted a little bit. Certainly, the medication error issue is still extremely important, but there is also a focus on secure methods for prescribing controlled substances. Um, we, we've seen a steady growth in the use of e-prescribing for non-controlled substances. Um, currently about 92% of physicians e-prescribe. Um, however, there's a majority of those prescriptions that are um, non-controlled substances or um, drugs that are not scheduled, that's what some people call them. It's just only um, about 16% of controlled substances that are e-prescribed. So that is a very limited amount. Why do you think there's been such a disparity between the e-prescribing of controlled medications versus non-controlled medications? It's only been in the last four years that scheduled or controlled medications have been permitted to be prescribed. Um, Older regulations at the state and federal level used to prohibit e-prescribing of those types of drugs. Back then, the thought was using special prescription pads would provide more security around people erroneously obtaining controlled substances. Um, Of course, as technology and security around the technology has evolved, um, so have our uh, thought processes uh, about Um, what types of medication should be Uh, e-prescribed. Another factor probably for that slower growth in e-prescribing of controlled substances are the additional technical updates that need to be implemented into systems 
to allow them to share uh, those types of prescriptions. And how do you think this will impact patients? Well, not sharing too much about my age, but I'm closer to retirement than I am to the beginning of my career. So I have seen the evolution of the use of technology by physicians. Uh, I'll share with you that my current physician prescribes, he prescribes my medications, um, and it's really just kind of part of her workflow. So today, if my doctor handed me a paper prescription, I don't know if I would remember what to do with it. I'm just so used to leaving the physician's office, going to the pharmacist, and my prescription being there, my medication being there. And although maybe the, I'm not typical of everyone, I think a majority of patients have adapt, adapted um, and adopted and expect even technology to help us with our health care and expect the convenience of having our prescriptions just be at the pharmacy. Thank you, Pam. One thing to note is that programs like e-prescribing do not happen in a vacuum. E-prescribing is now largely accomplished through electronic health record software. I spoke with Kim Davis Allen, who is the outreach coordinator for the Electronic Health Record Incentive Program at ACA. She spoke about the role of EHRs in healthcare delivery. Kim, for those not familiar with the EHR Incentive Program, can you provide a bit of background for us? Sure. The EHR Incentive Program was implemented in 2011, with the driving force being the adoption of electronic health record systems. The program provides incentive payments for the adoption and use of electronic health record systems. Adoption was only required for the initial payment, and then for subsequent years of participation, providers are required to meet certain requirements known as meaningful use. So Florida has participated in the program since 2011. To date, we have made over 17,000 payments to eligible professionals, and the program is slated to continue through 2021. In fact, uh, a recent study indicated an 80% adoption rate among all physician specialties so the adoption of the EHRs has really created that foundation for the electronic exchange of information by having the information in a format that could be accessed and shared. So now doctors of different practices can share information about a patient they both provide care to quickly and easily? Sure. Again, think about the old medical record systems, how bulky and for the more complicated or long-standing patients, just the sheer volume of paper made it very difficult to exchange relevant patient information. So as we move past just the adoption of these systems and really look at their functionality, uh, we really want providers to understand the investment that they have made in these systems and the impact it can have on ongoing care. So the EHR incentive program helps doctors adopt this new technology? Well, of course, this is an incentive program. There were some incentive payments and still incentive payments available to help offset some of the cost. These are huge investments in terms of cost, resources, workflow adjustments. And so the next step is really taking these systems to the next step. So when you're looking at the measures for stage three meaningful use, which all practitioners have to attest to this year and throughout the rest of the program, they are very heavily focused on patient engagement and care coordination. There are measures for actions uh, taken by the patient, such as accessing a patient portal. The goal there is to have that patient more engaged in actually controlling their information, sharing their information, reviewing their information to kind of help them be more involved in the healthcare decision making process process. There's also a measure focused on the physician side about exchanging patient information, especially as that patient moves through the healthcare systems. So having this, this information digitized or in an electronic format really helps that practitioner move it from point A to point B along as the patient moves as well. Thanks, Kim. We've heard about how e-prescribing and electronic health records are making a difference in healthcare delivery. Another aspect of health IT you may have heard of is Health Information Exchange, or HIE. I spoke with Aaron Parsons, who directly works with the Florida HIE as a manager at Audacious Inquiry. Audacious Inquiry is the vendor that manages the day-to-day -day operations of the Florida HIE. 
Erin, I was wondering if you could describe the way in which health information exchange relates to the EHR incentive program at ACA. These are definitely related initiatives. Uh, so the EHR incentive program and a lot of health information exchange efforts around the country share a common origin in high tech. And the idea with high tech was that the EHR incentive program would provide financial incentives for Medicare and Medicaid providers to uh, adopt and use uh, electronic health record systems and that uh, high tech funding to help build uh, HIEs around the country would provide um, the uh, technical infrastructure to allow physician practices and health systems to communicate with one another. So it would allow them um, to be able to exchange records. And we've seen the emergence of a number of HIEs or the growth of a number of HIEs uh, around the country. There's the nationwide efforts like the eHealth Exchange, uh, Care Equality and Commonwealth. Uh, there's statewide initiatives in almost every state that have taken on a variety of different shapes uh, based on local need. Uh, and these have been built up or uh, have built upon high tech funding. Uh, so there's CRISP in Maryland. And then there's a number of regional and local health information exchanges. Uh, so the Health Share Exchange of Southeastern Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Here in Florida, there's Strategic Health Intelligence over in Pensacola um, that are facilitating local exchange among providers. So how does this all work in practice? Would a provider simply search for a patient's medical record at the point of care? That's definitely one way that it works, uh, where you come into your doctor's office and they query, or they, they queried in preparation for the appointment, um, and they've searched and retrieved your records from connected health systems, from other practices, and they have those available at the point of care to provide them better context on the current visit, right? That is kind of the uh, use case that's familiar to a lot of individuals, to a lot of patients with health information exchange, right? Your doctor has access uh, and they're more informed as part of their treatment of you. Um, but there are other forms of health information exchange that have emerged that are um, serving a very real need. And one of those are uh, alerting services. Uh, so alerting services provide an opportunity for a primary care physician or for others involved in patient's care uh, to be notified when their patient has an encounter at a connected facility. So the use case here is a bit different, right? You have a scheduled appointment, you go to your primary care practice, your doctor has your records. Um, alerting services provide an opportunity for your physician to know that you were seen at the hospital, um, you know, last night or last week, so that they have an opportunity to not only engage with the hospital, to uh, help improve coordination of care, to provide relevant clinical documentation to the hospital, uh, to let them kind of know about your general health status, um, but also for your primary care physician or others to be able to follow up with you as the patient after you've had an encounter. Um, it's not top of mind for a lot of patients uh, to follow up with their provider after they have a hospital encounter, and so alerting services uh, fill that need. So and alerting services are comparatively low cost and high impact. So they've become an important component of the sustainability strategies for a lot of HIEs as they move away from public funding. And alerting is a big part of the Florida HIE, is that correct? It is, it is. The encounter notification service uh, offered by the Florida Health Information Exchange uh, has become the flagship service of the Florida HIE. Uh, it currently covers over 97% of acute care hospitals, and we have a large number of health systems, primary and specialty care practices, uh, skilled nursing facilities, hospice, other post-acute care providers, uh, accountable care organizations, payers, and other eligible covered entities that are currently participating. Um, and so ENS is uniting um, all of these different kinds of healthcare organizations uh, by providing encounter notifications um, in real time as the encounters occur. Uh, and we currently cover over 10 million patient identities via ENS in the state of Florida. So we've had really exciting progress. We're delivering over a million encounter notifications each month, which is really a million opportunities um, for network participants to um, provide better coordinated care and to engage with their patients to make sure that appropriate uh, follow-up care is provided to their patients. So what type of growth do you expect to see with the Florida HIE? So we've grown a lot over the last couple of years, and our growth is really 
driven by input from stakeholders and participants in the network. So the agency has several stakeholder advisory bodies that provide input and feedback on the direction of the Florida Health Information Exchange. And then we receive regular feedback from our health system payer, ACO, and physician participants in the network about the ways in which they would like to see it grow. So it really is driven in large part by the feedback that we receive through those channels. Um, and with that in mind, we've grown the network in a number of ways recently. Um, earlier this year, we added uh, over 86% of inpatient rehab hospital beds to the network in the state. Uh, and we are actively working to add other post-acute care providers, particularly skilled nursing, to the network. Uh, we've currently uh, signed up about 20% of skilled nursing facilities in the state to be data sources to the network, and we're in the process of onboarding them so that they can not only share their admit and discharge data, but receive notice when one of their recently discharged patients is seen at a connected hospital. Um, so we'll be adding post-acute to the network, really at the um, demand of network participants. Thanks, Aaron. Many times when we talk about health IT, we hear about the benefits that a healthcare provider will receive when using a certain system. How does the patient fit into all this and what improvements in their healthcare can they expect to see? Telehealth is increasingly becoming a way to bring high quality healthcare to patients who may not be able to make it into a doctor's office because of geographical or logistical reasons. Here's Pam King from ACA again. Pam, let's talk about telehealth. Well, Chris, telehealth could arguably be the epitome of health IT. It is the use of technology to deliver health care. There was actually legislation that passed uh, this past legislative session that provides some context around telehealth. The new law provides a definition of telehealth and specifies the types of healthcare practitioners here in Florida that can use this type of technology to treat their patients. But Chris, telehealth is not new. Uh, the capability has been around since the 1960s. Uh, if we think about radiologists reading x-rays, um, it really kind of gives context to how long the capabilities um, to actually see a patient image and make a diagnosis based on that image has been around. Uh, of course, today technology um, has evolved and allows physicians to see patients right in their homes on our smartphones. You know, we carry these computers with us everywhere we go, and so we can see um, practitioners pretty much wherever we are. So the telehealth technology has been around for decades. Absolutely, and many of our uh, healthcare organizations and systems here in the state of Florida have been using technology to treat patients for years now. Um, we have um, hospital systems that are working with schools to uh, promote uh, school telehealth programs. Uh, we have dental health programs operated by the Department of Health. Um, the use of, of telehealth to provide behavioral health is continuing to increase. We've just seen um, our own secretary, along with uh, the First Lady DeSantis, installing telehealth portals in school systems to assist students in receiving health care at their schools. The agency has supported the use of telehealth for many years and has even expanded its support through our contracts with Medicaid managed care plans. Uh, th these plans require reimbursement for practitioners treating patients through the use of telehealth technology. So we're seeing a growth in the use of telehealth by practitioners to see patients where they're at instead of the customary office visit. Why do you think that is? Well, there's probably several reasons for this. Uh, one of them being there is a shortage of certain types of healthcare practitioners like psychiatrists, psychologists, other specialty uh, providers, and there's also the increased availability of technology and acceptance of that technology. And also with patients, there is, are time and money constraints involved. There's 
over a hundred use cases for telehealth. A couple of those are the use of telehealth to see nursing home patients so that that frail patient doesn't have to be transported to a hospital. Uh, mental health counseling is definitely a, a growing area in the telehealth field. Physical therapy and follow-up consultations with physicians is also a growing area of, of interest with practitioners. I know we had um, an example provided to us by a physician where they were actually doing follow-up visits with patients uh, in their rehab facility after knee replacements so that the physician could actually speak with the patient, the physical therapist, and the patient's at-home caregiver at the same time so that they can have a group conversation about that health care. You know, all of the use cases that we have uh, provide patients with greater access to medical care. They reduce preventable hospital readmissions, reduce wait times for patients to see their physicians. Um, I know we have examples of patients that used to have to wait months to see a psychiatrist. And now with the use of telehealth, psychiatrists are able to see more patients and reduce that wait time. Telehealth also offers providers with improved convenience, efficiencies, and patient outcomes. Thank you, Pam. The Agency for Healthcare Administration has also implemented tools to help the public make more informed healthcare decisions when it pertains to quality and price through a website called FloridaHealthFinder.gov. Jess Hand, who's the outreach coordinator for Florida Health Finder, explained its role in improving healthcare for patients in Florida. Hi, Jess. Can you tell us what is the purpose of FloridaHealthFinder.gov? Many people don't realize that the Agency for Healthcare Administration licenses approximately 44,000 healthcare facilities in Florida, and the agency collects a tremendous amount of information about those facilities. So Florida Health Finder exists as a one-stop shop where anyone can find the agency's information about facilities like hospitals and nursing homes, home health agencies, and many more. What kind of information can consumers find on the website? That's a great question. When I introduce new visitors to the website, they are usually stunned by how much information they can find. On Florida Health Finder, you can find and compare pricing information for medical procedures and prescription drugs, and you can see how well nursing homes, hospitals, home health agencies, assisted living facilities, health plans, for example, compare to each other. So there are links to inspection reports and legal actions for the facilities that the agency licenses, and you can even print copies of medical forms like living wills and organ donor cards. And how can consumers use the website to make healthcare decisions? Well, here in Florida, there is a large long term care community, as you know, and many people use Florida Health Finder when they are in the process of choosing a nursing home or an assisted living facility for themselves or for a family member. And if you're planning a medical procedure, you can use the website to find out how many times a hospital has done that procedure, for example, or to find out approximately how much it might cost. Where can you go to learn more? Florida Health Finder, of course. I offer free webinars every week, so these will introduce you to the website, and you can contact me on Florida Health Finder at the bottom of the screen by clicking the Request Free Webinar button. Or you can email me at jessica.hand, H-A-N-D, at aca.myflorida.com. Thank you, Jess.
Well, I hope that today's discussion on health information technology has given you an idea of what is happening in Florida when it comes to enhancing the technological tools that are available to providers and patients for administering and receiving health care. The Agency for Healthcare Administration continues to promote and pursue these tools as a way to enhance its mission of better health care for all Floridians. In our next few episodes celebrating National Health IT Week, we will dig deeper into how health IT is shaping the individual experiences of those who come into contact with it by sharing personal perspectives from patients and providers. You can stay up to date with the podcast episodes and all other agency-related news through our social media pages on Twitter at Aka underscore FL on Facebook through Florida Agency for Healthcare Administration, and on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining us today. For Health IT Matters, this is Chris Wilkie. Here's to your health.